Hello and welcome to the test screening. I'm Billy. I'm Chloe. We're two film school graduates and cinephiles who can't seem to get enough of the big screen. So now we're bringing you our weekly insights into the biggest releases, hottest topics and forgotten classics every Monday. Hello and welcome back to the test screening. My name is Chloe. And my name is Billy. So to kick us off this week, we're going to talk a little bit about restorations. And Billy, what has prompted this subject? Yes, so this week, as part of a of its uh, its anniversary, um, I think it's the I think it's nearly the thirtieth anniversary. Actually, is um is Christoph Kieslowski's Three Colors trilogy. Christoph Kieslowski is a very influential Polish director, and from uh, I think 1993 to 1994, he directed three films, Blue, White and Red, which they kept up on this pedestal in the history of world cinema as being some of the most, I think, poetic and sort of enigmatic series of films that have you know, ever been contributed to international cinema. And they've always intrigued me due to the fact that how how cerebral and insular the the character portraits are versus how wide and and vast the the humanistic themes of the film are it's said that they were based off the colors of the french flag i remember watching them for the first time in first year of university and thinking they were they were just magnificent and had so much extra information to glean from them and this this idea of you know, pulling back layers of them has has in, has intrigued me throughout the years, and the fact that they're now getting a re-release and can be experienced by a whole new sector of people and audience members, and also allows me, a, a viewer and fan of them, to become reacquainted with their themes, um, is I think it's just a really wonderful opportunity. And of course, the restorations, the 4K restorations, look gorgeous. I mean, I saw Blue recently. It's a couple of days ago, it's out now at, in um, UK cinemas, and in the coming weeks, on the seventh of April and the fourteenth of April, um, white and red will also be coming out. I would urge everyone to go and get and check them out. And it really just got me thinking about some slightly more obscure, older films in you know international cinema and also Western and Eastern and European cinema as well, and and also cult classics, more under the radar picks that perhaps wider audience members aren't either as aware of or hadn't had the chance to see on the big screen and get the full cinematic experience with. So I just wanted to really ask you and, and talk about if there were any that sort of jumped out to you as being particularly of note and that you would like to see on the big screen or become restored or redistributed. Oh, well, I was, I was just thinking about this and as soon as you start thinking about it, you can't stop. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's like a film fan, you're just like, oh my god, all of these films that I'd love to see restored and put back in the cinema. I mean, one of my favourite films of all time is Hedwig and the Angry Inch. And I introduced you to this film, was it at the end of uni? It was near the end of uni, we had like a, a watch of it. And I've introduced a couple other uni friends to it, and it's such a joyous collective viewing experience. I think it's akin to like Rocky Horror Picture Show and all of those other like queer cult classics. And I think it deserves a little bit more love. So I'd love to see that restored and put on the big screen. I think it'd be one of those where people could dress up and go and see it and just have a really good time. It's just such a mad and fantastic and heartfelt film. I feel something every time. <laughs> I watch it it's very dear to me so i'd love to see that get a bit a bit of a, a 4k treatment i think it, w- it would look so crispy in 4k just those oh, yeah. those those bright extravagant and um, flamboyant rock musical sequences i love that movie so much i think it's it kind of tears up the musical playbook and it's kind of whacked out with its its visual and how how it visualizes those abstract sort of issues of gender that the main character is going through and yeah it's just an incredibly entertaining and, and wild time and and there's that great scene in sex education obviously when eric and otis they they dress up as mm. as hedwig and go see it at the cinema so and i just i just love to get involved in something like that and, uh, be so and ju- good. yeah and just in general i'm a big fan of john cameron mitchell's work i actually his 
I, I, I don't think it was... I can't remember if it was after or before Hedwig of the Angry Inch. I think it might have been afterwards. Yes, it was because it premiered at, at Cannes in 2006. Short Bus, which is quite a daringly provocative and also very explicit drama about sort of um, polyamorous sexual relationships. But um, I think is maybe the, the gold standard for me of using, you know, very explicit, you know, unsimulated sexual material in a drama and have that actually really positively inform the story and the the character and relationship examinations that are central to the plot. So, yeah, I'd, I'd love to see that one reissued as well. And I think just it's it's not widely available enough in general on sort of streaming services and also DVD and Blu-ray. So that, that would be a, another pick from his filmography for me also pick um one of the films that we're reviewing this week so we asked on instagram for cult classic suggestions um and the one that we chose this week was the lost boys and having watched it i would love to see this at the cinema (laughs) i would (laughs) restored and sit next to people watching all of this madness this mad hilarious fantastic movie go down i i think it'd be such a brilliant movie going experience so i'm i'm batting for the lost boys yeah just like those i mean the st- stuff like the rocky horror picture show is already you know it, it gets a lot of love i think cinemas do actually quite regularly replay it but i just think those those films where there's such you know effervescent humor at the core of them and just have such ridiculously off the wall, you know, eighties characteristics and interactions. I think would just be would just be great to see collectively because actually seeing another one of our reviewed film this films this week really made me. It reminded me of how joyous the experience of seeing something really funny and en- riotously entertaining is with an audience. So I think you know seeing something like that, like The Lost Boys, that has just so many campy. 80s lines and sequences in it would be just so much fun. Just one last one. Um, I'm aware that all of my picks are like campy queer. <laughs> oh, no, we need more of that. We need more. We need of that. more of them. But I'd I'd really like to see. But I'm a cheerleader at the cinema. Uh, I don't know that one. Oh my god, it's so good. It's got Natasha Leone in it, and she plays a a lesbian cheerleader. She doesn't think she's a lesbian, um, but and but everyone else in her life thinks she's a lesbian. She's sent to this um, conversion camp where RuPaul plays one of the head conversion <laughs> people, and it's just it's a classic. It's so funny. It's so weird. And okay, we need to we need to get you watching this because it is it's yes. a joy. It's so good. <laughs> RuPaul playing a conversion therapist is like the same energy as Taika Waititi playing Hitler in Jojo Honestly, Rabbit. Honestly, <laughs> it, is, it is just, it's just fantastic. It's one of the, the best, like, queer films. That, and, and again, you could play it in a cinema and the audience would get involved, I feel. It's one of those. There's such so many bright colours. Um, I think a restoration would do it wonders. So yeah, I'm saying, but I'm a cheerleader as well. Sorry, I'll let you give us some films now that I've gone down my no, no, it's, exceedingly it's okay. gay list. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think it's very important not to just include, you know, very highbrow stuffy dramas in that list. You know, why can't we just bring back, you know, really great I mean, I think we'll be talking about this on a future app. I recently saw a season at the watershed called Gender on Screen, which is about was about trans representation throughout cinema and there was a film in that season from I think 1969 from Japan of course I won't say too much about it because we'll go into more detail when we do that episode but I'd I'd never heard of that film and and seeing it again having the chance to have it projected on screen with um, with an entirely new audience and just see how you know brazenly progressive it was 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 so incredible and and then just also to have some of the other films in the season that were just sort of more fantastical and kind of like looking back to period dramas and things like that. You know, the the poetic art house drama is not, we shouldn't be limited to that with what we can bring back for screen. We can bring back stuff that has like representation ideas and had some like really forward thinking ideas that we can learn from now and also just be very entertaining. But, um, so no, I think I think it's important to keep genre variety within that. But no, I think one of my picks um, would be uh, so. 
in the late 50s, I think it was 1959, um, Masaki Kobayashi, who was a very revered Japanese film director, he directed a, a series of three epic war dramas called the, the Human Condition Trilogy. They're very long and very you know, winding and grand and vast dramas. And they all focus on the life of Kaji. He's a Japanese pacifist and, and socialist, and, he, and he's trying to survive you know, the oppressive world of post-World War II era Japan and the totalitarian government. And whilst they're, whilst they're available on Blu-ray, they're just the kind of... They have such reverence and, and great cinematic standing in the, you know, the community of film lovers on social media that I feel like seeing them on screen, like in, in the cinema projected, would be just the, the ideal way to experience them. Especially because, you know, given that they're a trilogy, given that, you know, you and their length as well, that you would focus in so intently on each specific, you know, entry in the series. I think you would glean so much more out of the out of the weight of the drama and also the the interconnecting themes between the three of them. And yeah, I would just no greater love, Road to Eternity, and a shot the Soldier's Prayer from you know nineteen fifty nine, nineteen and nineteen sixty, nineteen sixty one. Though that would be my choice for kind of like bucket list. What would I love to see in the cinema for the first time rather than just on DVD? That's um, that would be my that would be my golden pick. Let's get into our reviews. As much as I love this topic and talking about all of the fabulous films that we'd want to see again. Um, so some new ones first, and first on the list is John Wick Four, which I assume is leading on from John Wick One, Two, and Three. It most certainly is. As is this case with most of the other John Wick films, this picks up in the immediate aftermath of the chaos that was John Wick Chapter 3, which saw, you know, the, the Continental Hotel um, being, you know, excommunicated and desecrated from the, the high table, the large authority of assassins that John Wick is reluctantly tethered to, you know, for the rest of his life and he's trying to break free from. And John Wick 4 immediately begins with the, you know, the start of John's sort of final climactic efforts to finally rid himself of the high table once and for all, you know, going on a, on a final killing spree after, you know, the many killing sprees that have permeated the series. And, you know, going up against Bill Skarsgård, who is one of the marquees of the high table, and trying to, you know, propose a sort of a duel and a final battle that if he wins can you know relieve him of his obligation to the high table and allow him to live a, a peaceful life once and for all with the with the help of you know his his friends over at the continental you know played by Ian McShane and Lance Reddick obviously it's important before we get into the review to say that it was it was strange seeing you know Lance Reddick on screen again having you know the really tragic news of his of his recent passing and it's just a reminder that he was such a, a wonderfully you know believable and consistent actor in everything he did and he was often playing you know consummate professionals and figures of authority in a lot of his roles in Bosch and The Wire and you know Lost and also John Wick and it was it was just a joy to see him again on screen and was a really wonderful reminder of all he managed to contribute in his in his career and i i urge anyone to go and check out his his private his prior work in things such as the wire which is my favorite role of him as the as the chief of the, the criminal investigation team in that show now on to john wick in a more general sense what to me has been so immensely satisfying about watching this franchise progress from you know a medium sized original ip action film into a full blown you know, action series, is that it's proven one vital thing for the future of action cinema that I think has been forgotten. And that's the fact that you don't need to rigidly stick to this disorientingly jagged visual and editing style for fight sequences to make a really successful and gratifyingly chaotic, chaotic and violent action picture. You don't have to riddle the action with a million quick cuts that render most physical scraps completely incomprehensible. 
in the style of like Paul Greengrass or Taken Two, which I think is <laughs> Taken Two is probably the the low point for that that I can think of. You can simply pull the camera back and let the choreography speak for itself in providing the thrill, rather than the camera movement becoming overly participatory in the chaos. And John Wick has always found a a stylistic touchstone in the heroic bloodshed films of you know, 80s Hong Kong action cinema, you know, a movement which saw heavily melodramatic tales of duty and brotherhood and honour paired with this combination of balletic gunplay and martial arts, you know, most notable in the films of John Woo, like A Better Tomorrow and Hard Boiled, also Ringo Lam's City on Fire. And I find this style ridiculously entertaining, and it's great to see it repurposed with the slickness and finesse provided by a Hollywood style budget. Interestingly, better tomorrow in John and John Woo and Hard Boiled. Let's get those reissued as well. But John Wick has helped put athleticism for me back into action filmmaking. And what's wonderful wonderful about this fourth entry is that it's up the ante in terms of the melodrama and the chaos departments without pushing it into eye roll inducing territory within the context of this somewhat heightened world. The action still feels raw and you know physically credible due to the proficiency of the choreography and how brilliantly it's executed. And there are several major action highlights in the fourth entry that are just minds minds boggling in you know, how va- you know, vast they are in their in their complexity of the the various stages that the fight sequences go to. And they fantastically use the geography of the settings to inform the unique movement of each scenario. The, you know, the multi-tier dance floors in a nightclub in one scene, the sounds of, gl- of breaking glass cases in a hotel that clues in a blind character as to where threats are coming from in another, a famous real-life roundabout and the cars travelling through it being obstacles and points of cover during a gunfight. There's this really excellent long-take sequence w- during a shootout which the camera sort of moves up above the chaos into sort of a top-down perspective almost like it's a it's one of those old style retro video games where you're you know top-down perspective and you're moving through multiple rooms as john's dispatching you know waves and waves of of soldiers there's also a staircase fight that really terrifically like calls back to <clears throat> uh, tom young gung's 2005 asian film the protector Without, while also putting its own spin on it and having a great spot of environmental humour and the way they sort of balletically like jump over the the railing that connects the two different sides of the staircase and how they ebb and flow around that is is really a sight to behold. The action here is handily the most impressive of the series and it tastefully grows the scenes in their scale from previous entries. And a, But a worry I had going in was that would be the film's ability to sustain. Do you know how long it is? No, oh, how long is it? It's a very uh, beefy two hours and 40 minutes. Like, Ooh, it's okay, yeah, it, it's a hefty runtime, especially for um, you know, a balls out action picture. And considering the fact that you know, dense narrative has never really been John Wick's focus, you know, would it be able to prop this up and keep it consistently entertaining throughout that, that runtime? And the action sequences obviously make up a lot of of that sort of narrative real estate. But this fourth entry does a really respectable job of injecting real tension and gravitas and stakes into the plot. The tone and the build is very weighty, and the mournful tone of both the score and the exchanges of dialogue make everything feel really climactic. And it genuinely made me feel as though things might not necessarily actually go to plan in the end, which I think is hard to do. I mean, it's it's very hard to do when you're when you have a protagonist this deadly and you know borderline indestructible. But the John Wick films have always done a really good job of you know keeping him very keeping him just vulnerable enough, and you know having the wear and tear of you know the the, the violence and the action he's you know and destruction he's perpetuating you know take a physical toll on him. So you never feel like he's, you know, getting out of every scenario unscathed and that he's, you know, there's no chance of him ever failing. And the ending, it finds it, obviously without spoiling anything, it finds a terrific balance of delivering, you know, what what we've wanted out of this story for a long time, but also giving you what 
the character really needs in the end. And and for me, it it didn't end how I actually expected it to, which I think is a real, which I think is a real success. And you know, to have the the final moments be as conclusive and as satisfying as they are, and you know, bringing you know the action and both the more emotional count counterpoint of the story full circle was yeah it was it was just really satisfying for me and made this a very i was very pleased with this as a final entry and sort of a cap off in both in terms of the scale of the action and also wrapping up the story if i have one complaint it's that certain parts don't feel entirely necessary even if they are serviceably entertaining and especially considering that long run time there's a side assassin character who is pretty superfluous and basically adds nothing outside of the dog he has having some good kills. There's a there's a great sort of game where, he, where he would he says nuts to the to the to his German shepherd and the the dog basically runs up and aggressively bites the soldiers between the legs. It's, it's sort of it, it's it's pri- primarily entertaining. And there's a section early on which, especially when you link it in with the later post credit scene. It feels as though it serves more to queue up the already announced spin-offs than it contributes more to the overarching plot, which is all, which is obviously already very lengthy. The action in it is solid, though, and generally the script does a good job of giving narr- narrative justification for why John Wick has to go on all these globe trotting exercises. You know, there's a very we have to do this to get this item to talk to talk slash kill this person and get onto this next stage, which puts us in the room with this person. So it's all very, you know, well built out in terms of the reasoning for every event and how they need to progress them onto the various stages of this mission. That one event early on in the Japanese hotel, it kind of just it stuck out to me more as not having a solid a plot reasoning. Um, but I do, I, I am looking forward to the to this to one of the spin-offs because of who's starring in it, Rina Sawayama, one of my favourite pop stars, who's also turning out to be a really terrific action star and actress so i very much look forward to that too but um yes i i solidly in, enjoyed john wick for i think it's quite easily the strongest of the of the franchise and strongest of whilst the franchise. Me, that's I, yeah. I, I i'm i've not seen the third one but i thoroughly enjoyed the second and the first <laughs> but i think the second is is so far my favorite so it, it surpasses passes all of them I I think so. In terms of just the the outlandishness of the action and how impressive it is, but and both you know how how grave and emotion, uh, emotional to a certain extent they managed to make the the story in its climactic moments. Yeah, I th- I think this is I think this is the strongest one, and generally people are agreeing. I don't think John Wick as a franchise in general wa- wows me in its fight choreography as much as say the Raid. Or some martial arts cinema, you know. For me, I think the raid is, you know, sits at an even higher standard. But I think this is still very solid, and I had a really good time with this. I would give this a solid B plus. Okay, so moving on from a, you know, you kind of know what you're getting when you go into a John Wick film, but you never know what you're going to get when you go into a Cronenberg film. So. <laughs> Um, moving on to Infinity Pool, and listen, I watched I watched like the trailer, and I am none the wiser for what the hell this film is about. Oh. So please, uh, please let me know, or or maybe you saw the film and you're still not aware of what the film is about. <laughs> no, I, I I think after having watched it, I I am more aware of what okay. Brandon Cronenberg was going for. But like you, I watched the trailer and was absolutely none the wiser, which I like. <laughs> I like being I like being perplexed by a trailer and going, I don't know what the hell's going on in that, but I want to see it anyway because it looks messed up and intriguing. <laughs> and that's and, and this is a wild ride. It most certainly is messed up and intriguing. And. Uh, sort of shockingly entertaining as well. So we focus on James and M. Foster. Um, she is uh, she is rich and James is a, a sort of struggling writer who wrote one kind of middling book about six years ago who he probably only managed to get that published due to the fact that he's married um, M. 
who essentially married into wealth and her father is a sort of a media uh, literary publishing mogul. And they're staying at an all-inclusive beach vacation in the fictional island of Latolka, which is supposed to be quite a, a, a lawless island and dangerous place to be outside of the complex and the, the beach vacation resort. And, you know, they're forbidden to travel outside of the resort. And he meets a kind of a strange couple, one of whom is played by the, you know, immensely talented Mia Goth. And she kind of goes, oh, I read your book. And he's like, what, really? You, you read my book? And his wife is kind of like, oh, wow, you finally found your fan club. And he's like, well, I knew there had to be somewhere. And they, they're, a very, they're a very kind of strange, but also sort of magnetically compelling couple. And they travel outside the resort to a, you know, a nearby beach, which they're not technically allowed to do, but, you know, this, they're sort of very strangely inviting and sort of, they pull you in this pair. And through a, a series of quite bizarre events, I don't want to say too much because I think this film will really benefit from you not knowing very much about the plot. Um, but through a strange set, series of events, they find themselves in, in legal hot water, very hot water. And the situation is looking very dire. But what the police and the government then then say to the group is that, you know, outside of you, you know, being very gravely punished, there is actually a very strange and sort of science fiction laden method you can do to escape justice and punishment here. And what the film essentially does with with the typical brand of Cronenbergian sci-fi laden body horror is it essentially envisions a scenario in when the uh, when the sense of punishment and consequence as a result of committing really terrible actions you know are taken are removed from a situation involving you know the very hedonistic and decadent you know upper class and, and rich high society people what then does that do to a person's you know moral codes and their, you know, their personality, and how does that then change them? Which are all, I think, really compelling themes, and I think were really, you know, you know, opened up a lot by the end of the film. I think it took, you know, it takes time to get there, but I think it does in the end. Alexander Skarsgård is really solid here. I mean, he's, you know, he's a reliably great actor, and I think he gets the kind of pathetic, you know, puppy dog like, oh, you liked my book, kind of feeble quality of. Uh, of James and how he can be so easily manipulated and pulled along you know in this sort of very unusual scenario but he also gets you know the real you know fiery animalistic you know really he's asked to do a lot of really big reaching in terms of some of the really unusual activities that the group then engage in later on and he absolutely pulls it off and he and he gets you know that shrieking hysteria and you know and you know aggressive immorality later on, and Mia Goth just—I mean, we talked about her recently in Pearl and X, and she just continues to absolutely just deliver top draw performances where she is able to switch between being you know, you know cute, cutely sympathetic and you know brazenly unhinged at the drop of a hat. She is an absolute star, and I. I am fully on the hype train for her. I will watch absolutely anything this this girl is in, and you know she she continues to to wow me endless endlessly. And for me, what's really great about Brandon Cronenberg's particular style of surrealism and filmmaking within the great you know Cronenberg tradition of you know sci sci fi body horror and very primal primal examination of human issues. Is that I think he goes a lot more humanistic and cerebral with it. You know, I think I find a lot of, I mean, I, I love a lot of David Cronenberg's films. I also really don't like a lot of them as well. I can I have a bit of a love hate relationship with them. And I think in the ones I don't quite take to, a very, a very kind of either removed and coldly detached, and I don't feel really feel gets the heart of some of their central characters, or they kind of they're not. I, I enjoy them, but they don't necessarily go into they don't kick into high gear quality wise for me because they, they rely on very kind of primal um, violence and simplistic issues of 
of horror within the social political landscape um, in films like Rabbit, rather than you know getting to the heart of the emotional core of of the characters and why they do the things they do, which is something that Brandon really finds a a, a, a strong grip on with Infinity Pool, and and all the while being very you know you know searingly hallucinogenic and you know very wild and abstract with a lot of the the things he you know he shows on screen he has lots of dashes of you know Gaspar Noé inflected you know extreme cinema you know there's a little bit of Pasolini in there as well and whilst I wouldn't say that the the perspective is as tactile and as intimate as his previous film Possessor which I think is very tethered to the main character's perspective and I think you really feel in a much more palpable sense, you know, that character struggle with identity. This does have a bit more of, Infinity Pool does have a bit more of that classically removed, detached David Cronenberg-esque quality. But I think the, the precision of his character examination um, means that Infinity Pool is still very compelling in how it, it examines sort of this, this duality and these sort of Freudian-esque issues of you know, who you present to the outer world versus, you know, the really depraved part of you that's on the inside. And I also think this film does a much better job of examining, you know, the hedonistic, you know, you know immoral, um, yeah, unvarnished, you know, wildly uncontrollable excess and evil of the upper class than, you know, a very simplistic and I think very drab film like Triangle of Sadness recently did. I do think that some of... Cron- Brandon Cronenberg's more provocative touches. There's a there's a very sort of <laughs> gratuitously graphic and sort of out of nowhere sex scene that occurs early on that uh, the whole audience is just like, whoa, that's a bit <laughs> that's surprisingly <laughs> full on. Um, wasn't expecting that. And also some of the very sort of dr- drug addled and induced sort of orgy sequences later on. Um, I don't think they always have a strong you know, a plot reasoning and only a rhyme or reason to them as some of the stranger events do in Possessor, which I think always have a very clear, you know, thematic underpinning. Uh, So I think sometimes the madness works better when there's more like, when there's more rhyme or reason to it. But having said that, I still think... Would it be madness? Would it be madness? (laughs) Yes, yes. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, of course, of course, and th- and there is a certain charm in seeing, you know, a, a filmmaker in um in a fairly mainstream film with a lot of big stars in it, um, you know, let this loose and be this sort of wild and chaotic and obstrep- obstreperous, and sort of you know visually, you know, dazzling in how you know whacked out it is. Uh, but I, I do think some of that more solid script reasoning wouldn't have gone amiss in certain sequences. Also, earlier on, it sort of withholds information in the interest of building mystery, which I think is more befitting of this story than Possessor. But Possessor really kind of throws you in with this sort of grippingly violent introductory scenario and this really intriguing sci-fi conceit um, very, very soon into the film. And Infinity Pool takes a bit of time to get there which can leave some earlier portions of the film as patients testing you, kind of wondering where we're going to end up with these characters. But when we, you know, barrel full tilt into the insanity of of the plot, I do think the film starts firing on all cylinders. And I um, I enjoyed this very much. Um, um, I, was, I, I put this at a B plus when I initially saw it, but I'm feeling more of an A minus now. Um, I I think it's terrifically entertaining and very bold. And Brandon Cronenberg has certainly established his own voice, independent of his father. This is a uh, this is very good. Okay, so moving on from Infinity Pool, we're now going to talk about the film that was recommended to us. So I want to do a shout out to Yonky Donkey on Instagram. This is the Lost Boys. It's been recommended to me before, but I don't know why held back on it but I had such a good time with this I loved it um it is so 80s I don't think I've ever seen anything that is so 80s that is actually made in the 80s it's so 80s it's almost a parody of the 80s (laughs) 
it's the hair and the the dialogue and oh, right we've got we've got a lot to get into so yeah. <laughs> really. I, I remember watching i remember watching like the original top gun and thinking, man, this is the most 80s movie to ever exist. And boy, was I wrong. Because the level of 80s <laughs> camp in The Lost Boys is like higher than the planes, the altitude that the planes have flown at in Top Gun. The cheese is like in the stratosphere. And yet it completely works. I've, I've had this on DVD for years. And it was, it was bought for me by someone who wanted me to watch it years ago. And I, this finally gave me the excuse to sit down and watch it. And I'm so glad I did because I had an absolute blast. The plot centres around these two boys. Their mother has separated from their father, they need somewhere to live, so they go and stay with their granddad who lives in the creepiest house imaginable, filled with taxidermy animals <laughs> and all sorts of, of weird things. And the sign that they pass out, there's this brilliant opening montage when they first arrive in Santa Carla, which is a fictional town kind of based on Santa Cruz. And uh, there's this brilliant montage to the song. It, it, what's it? It's when you're strange. And we zoom in on all of these odd characters that are kind of around on the streets. You get a real sense of how different this place is compared to, you know, where they come from. All of these alternative lifestyles and things that they're zooming in on. It's a fantastic montage. And they pass this sign and on the back of the sign, it just says murder capital of the world. <laughs> <laughs> and if if that isn't like an early indication that this film kind of knows what it is, <laughs> then I don't know what it is. I mean, I throughout the film, I was kind of thinking, is this does this film is this film self aware or is it just really eighties? Because um, you know, there's been films in the past where you, know, you think it's a comedy, but it isn't. It's just eighties, um, and I think that this. Film definitely had like a, a Spielbergy Goonies sensibility to it, where I I just wasn't sure how serious it was taking itself. But that <laughs> sign at the beginning definitely kind of indicates, okay, this is going to be a ride, and we're we're going to take you on the roller coaster, uh, the literal roller coaster in some cases. And yeah, you're going to have a great time. Um, I think it's fu- I think it's fully aware of how unabashedly nutty and outlandish it is. But I think the real joy for this, for me, was is that in terms of the filmmaking, it still manages to be really cinematic in spite of the camp and the cheese. In that sense, it really reminds me of like Point Break, like the Catherine Bigelow film, in how much you, you have this really robust directorial craft that's propping up the cheesiest plot and dialogue on planet Earth. And but I think I think the difficulty with something like Point Break is that it takes itself seriously enough as an action thriller. The, the the howlingly awful dialogue and ludicrous action, it just reads as tremendously cringeworthy. I said a similar thing recently about Cocaine Bear as well. That you know it took itself too seriously to work work as a Joe B movie. But I think in the case of the Lost Boys, you know the, the technical proficiency makes the action and visuals you know impressively entertaining, but. The film being so aware of how goofy the story turning characters are, you know, it, it just makes it all outrageously fun to watch. You know, it has, in the tradition of, you know, vampire films, it has a generous do- dose of that darkly foreboding, like lawless neo Western atmosphere of, of another great vampire film, Near Dark. But it just piles on the camp and humor to just make it outrageous fun to watch. Being a Buffy fan as well, so I'm not. Uh, I'm I'm now aware of where a lot of the inspiration for Buffy comes from because there are a lot of similarities. Um, I think one of the main similarities that I uh, it's actually something I'm I'm a sucker for this trope in like supernatural fiction, and it's kind of using supernatural monsters as a metaphor for growing up. It's basically all that Buffy's about. Um, and Lost Boys does it as well in actually a really fantastic way, but instead with like a male character instead of a, a female character. If you kind of view it as it's that age where you know, the older brother is starting to detach from his younger brother and he's starting to go out at night and he's starting to drink and he's starting to meet up with his friends. He's starting, like, there's, um, you know, the scene where he's, like, walking around the house with these sunglasses on and it's, like, you know, it very clearly a metaphor for having a hangover, you know, <laughs> the night after yeah. where he has these glasses on. It's just that whole thing of, you know, when 
when teenagers go through that like rebellion that need to establish themselves as an individual i think that the film actually handles that really really well as as campy as the vampire stuff laden on top is a whole thing of like trying to find your tribe trying to find where you fit um you know in a place where realistically he doesn't have many friends his own age the older brother michael i mean his michael's name i kid you not i look this up <laughs> I, the word Michael is said at least like around once every minute <laughs> in the film. Like there, and, and when you watch it back, you can see it because it's, it's Michael just said in so many different variations. It's like Michael, Michael, Michael. <laughs> this... Actually, thinking back to the film, it actually it, it occurred to me when you said that to me. Like on average, it said nearly once per minute. I go, yeah, they do say it a lot. <laughs> they, say, they say the name Michael a lot. Um, but yeah, I really enjoyed that side of it. And of course, you've got the younger brother who's kind of you know, rejecting these, the fact that his brother's kind of growing, growing away from him um, and becoming this blood-sucking fiend. Um, and he teams up with these two boys in the comic book store who are like <laughs> amateur vampire hunters. And I love them. I, I love them so much. <laughs> It must it's, be protected at all costs. Corey must. Feldman spe- <laughs> speaking in his deep big boy voice that makes him sound like he's smoked a hundred cigarettes every day for the past year. <laughs> it's so funny. I loved it. But that that was another thing that, I mean, obviously he's in the Goonies. And that's probably where that kind of Goonies, Steven Spielberg-esque feel came from. Those boys in the comic book. They've got like a bit of that, um, you know, younger adventure. And looking this up, Apparently it was intended to be a film for younger audiences and I can see that now, knowing that, I can kind of see how this would be a film for younger audience but apparently the the director decided to up the gore and up the kind of teenage side of it um, to create the cult classic that we ended up with. I must say, those, okay, I don't want to spoil too much but the ending, some of the stuff that goes on in the ending... It's so entertaining. It's so like gross <laughs> and wild, and you know, it's like it reminds me a bit of John Wick. You know, where you just want to see how he's going to kill all these people. That kind of ending scene where there's just like a, a vampire massacre, and you go through like all of these creative ways to like end a vampire. There's a, a bath filled with garlic. <laughs> so I thought it's genius. There's a bit where the boys run into a church to get holy water and it's in the middle of a christening and that just, that sent me. I thought that was so funny. There's so so many hysterically funny moments, like that bit where he's flying horizontally outside of his brother's bedroom (laughs) and there's a bedroom window and his brother's head right is like, ah! (laughs) Or, Or like... The girl on the floor where she's kind of like, don't, she could be one of them and then she just appears in the room. She's like, she's one of them! (laughs) Yeah, or like that that sort of perf- weird performance scene at the carnival early on, where you get this like oiled up, greasy saxophone player with like with like Jean 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 Claude Van Damme looking guy blasting what away on that? the sax. I'm like, what is happening? And like, no, the Lost Boys has to be deserving of some kind of award for the best hairstyle movie of all time. Oh my I god, mean, yes. my my god, it's just. It's just a sea of mullets. It makes the <laughs> mullet look like a work of art. There's a moment where Kiefer Sutherland walks into a convenience store with his bleach blonde spiked spiked mullet and a dog growls at him. And I was like, yes, yes, boy. If I, if I, if I saw a haircut like that, bud, I would growl too. Um, it's, and it's such a mood. <laughs> it's like, yeah, it's like, what is that about? abomination on your head and also I, I do have to give a special mention to what i think is the greatest line in cinematic history the reason i think i divorced your mo- your father was that he never believed in the closet monster <laughs> <laughs> oh my god i'm just like how did they get the great diane weist saying <laughs> lines of dialogue like this <laughs> yeah but then again you know and i say that i i joke about how the, some of the lines in it but you know the the zooming aerial shots over the island that reminds me of like the wild demon POVs and the evil dead, you know, the really sharp montage editing, these propulsive crash zooms in and out of characters during action sequences and the general like attention to well composed, like widescreen framing of multiple characters in one shot. I think it just goes to show that solid visual moves can really elevate the entertainment factor that's 
present in campy material. You don't have to skimp on that just because the material isn't sophisticated drama. I think it's also really interesting looking at the time that it came out, um, especially considering all of these like alternative lifestyles that the the film kind of champions and, and looks at, uh, especially with that opening montage. It is a real love letter to changing times. And I, I, I don't know, I love looking at films from that kind of perspective as, of what was going on in the general, you know, zeitgeist at the time. I think Lost Boys really reflects that moment in, in time where things were changing and, and there was all this fear about, about goth and punk and all that. You know, genuinely people were like, thought that they were vampires. And I think it's just so genius that they're portrayed that way. Um, because I think this might have been one of the first films to really give them that 80s makeover, vampires, you know got all of these vampires that are in the Dracula style in the long cloaks and, and this film kind of shows them as the fears that America had. So I, I can 100% see why people fall in love with this film. I think I've fallen in love with it a little bit. I really enjoyed yeah, it. Yeah, me too. Me too. <laughs> I, I had a terrific time with it. I think if I was grading it, I would honestly give this like an A-. I, I think I just it it's really well made. It's like you say, it has real I think thematic depth when you actually dig below the camp and when you look at it within the context and the framing of what was going on in cinema and sort of American society at the time. And it's also just, just an absolute riot. It's so much fun. Like, you know, you can, you can have theme, you can have great technical filmmaking and you can have camp. And it was just really wonderful to see them all collide on screen here and work so well together. Yeah, I think I'd give this a solid A from me. I, I really, really enjoyed it. So we've got to move on um, now to The Five Devils. I actually don't know anything about this. I've not even heard of this one. So uh, what is The Five Devils? What's it about? And should we go and see it? So I was very intrigued by The Five Devils because, I mean, it stars Adele... Adele Exocopolis, and I'm a big fan of her. She's the youngest ever Palm Door winner, as she was credited as alongside the director with and and Leia Sadu as as winning the Palm Door for Blue is the Warmest Color, which is a brilliant which is a brilliant film, and I think um, would highly recommend. And she's wonderful in it. And it's a the Five Devils is a French sort of magical realist, you know, fantasy drama it's in general release in cinemas at the moment but it will be coming on uh, streaming on movie exclusively it's a movie release on the 12th of may so you can also find it there if you have access to movie and a lot of the promotional posters for it sort of painted it as looking very incendiary and wild and and you know, as does that very sort of uh, ear grabbing title so i was i was very intrigued uh, by it and was quite excited to w- watch it it's essentially about this kind of isolated um, community. Uh, I'm not sure exactly where where the film is set, but it's sort of this very sort of it's it's right in the middle of this mountain valley, um, this sort of like chilly, chilly environment, and uh, there's a, there's a town within it, and it's it revolves around a family who Adele Coppolis plays this quite sort of volatile young woman who is married to a black man she has a black daughter who is sort of the victim of a lot of you know racial hatred at school but she has the the uncanny sort of magical ability to to capture scent and like perfectly capture an aroma and then place it in a jar and she sort of packages up these various scents and jars and keeps around her room and part of the reason she does this is it allows her to travel back in time and to you know different points in her life and sort of the daughter goes through these sort of events and sees sort of how her life has been shaped up until this point and uh, you know her her mother and father's relationship and the complexities within that and also the complexities and relationship that that her mother had with uh, her the da- the daughter's aunt, her husband's sister, who is in jail at the start of the film and is released and seems quite mentally unstable, and we're kind of not sure as to why. And it's sort of a quite a knotty 
family drama and how that those sort of various characters and conflicts sort of ebb and flow through the course of the runtime. Given that I was excited for this to be quite out there and experimental and incendiary, it was actually greatly disappointing to then discover that what is actually offered here is the opposite of grif- gripping and actually a bit of a mess. It became quite clear to me over the course of watching The Five Devils that it's a film that's more deeply attuned with mood and sensation and atmosphere than it is with you know pinpointing precise narrative ideas. Now, in principle, I don't have an issue with this. You know, I can accept and find gratification in a film's approach that has broader and less decisive thematic points if the atmosphere that's then substituted in is very evocative and enveloping. If the film sweeps me away in its mood or casts its spell, then it can still com- it can still compel me. Ennis Main being a great recent example, Mark Jenkins' film, you know, plot and themes shrouded in great mystery and ambiguity, yet the atmosphere is so potent that I was just whisked away by it. But the serious issue that The Five Devils ends up having is that in terms of its atmosphere, it, it, it's pretty it's pretty bland. It's pretty inert and ordinary in its emotional tone and dramatic trappings, despite that magical realist slant. The direction, it's it's very unassuming, its visuals very homespun. There isn't really any effort made to infuse the story with attention grabbing, you know, visual storytelling or symbolism. This isn't helped by, you know, that very cold and remote and isolating setting that I mentioned when describing the plot, which only serves to make the story feel more drab. There's also very little in the way of a emotional build-up or peaks and valleys in emotion over the course of the runtime. In the end, there's also insufficient emotional or character payoff or psychological insight to keep the story interesting. Even the central magical realist conceit of time travel along with the capturing of the sense by the daughter, it, it it's visually rendered in a way that's devoid of any spark or power or vibrancy. It's just it's played very straight, which can make it feel which makes it feel more grounded, but it also makes it feel pretty uninteresting. And the screenplay also never really amounts the conceit to much. It doesn't it didn't deepen the themes much for me. It also that also ties into the film's general refusal to distill, you know, thematic ideas down into a digestible and interesting form. It leaves the film feeling pretty impenetrable at times. And the structure of the Five Devils is also it's pretty ungroomed and malformed. It quite disjointedly meanders between various characters and it never finds its feet with any particular arc or or point of audience connection for us it results in none of the cast feeling properly fleshed out or like the film has grasped has grasped what they brought to the overall narrative or themes they're just kind of there they're existing and the film's kind of just you know tracing them without much focus the film's, you know, in inverted commas, tying up of the ideas at the end is, if you can call it that, is also pretty obtuse and inconclusive and unsatisfying. It left the viewing, viewing experience feeling pretty inconsequential, like what actual character or narrative progression have I really seen here? And yeah, I was very underwhelmed overall and you know, pretty disappointed. And I just felt like this this screenplay really needed to go back to the drawing board in terms of really distilling what you know the key thesis is of the piece. You know, even if Adele Exocopolis's performance is you know very solid and she can, continues to do interesting work, and the rest of the cast are pretty are pretty solid as well. You know, I was overall I was I was very indifferent to this and you know not really gripped at all. And I would give this a C. Oh, that's a shame. I've got a feeling that this next one might be a little bit higher on your list. Um, so this oh, yes. is <laughs> By Lane, which is a new London-based rom-com. I'm excited for this one. What did you think? Oh, I have been, over the past week, I have been telling everyone and their mother to go see Rai Lane because it's, I mean, consi- I mean, it's not particularly surprising considering it is, you know, independent and British. Um, but it's not performing particularly well at the box office. And, you know, everyone on all the film critics on Twitter have been urging people to go see it in the cinemas. And I absolutely would too. We, we pick up uh, a boy, a young man called Dom, who is crying in a bathroom, public bathroom in an art gallery over a recent breakup. And she, and a, 
a, a young girl named uh, Yaz, similar age, uh, sort of hears him crying and goes, um, you okay? And he's like, I'm trying to have a private moment. What are, you, what are you doing? Go away. And he's like, well, you know. He's like, this is the gents. He's like, no, it's a, it's a, gender, it's a gender neutral toilet, actually. And he goes, well, it's, it's private. He's like, well, it's a public bathroom. It's, it's, she's like, it's not that private. And so there's kind of this initial sort of spark of vivacity between them. And they eventually start strike up a conversation at this art gallery and end up walking through Peckham, where a lot of the film is situated. And they begin to speak and they bond over sort of recent romantic troubles and sort of feeling sort of astray in life. And they sort of, the, the, there may sort of be sparks and hints of a romance starting to, starting to fly forth. And we, we follow these two over the course of 24 hours and we see how their, their relationships sort or of builds over that time. And I'm just going to come straight out and say it. This is the most unabashed fun I've had watching a movie in literal years. You know, Rye Lane has taken the condensed time frame, chance meeting, blissful, walk and talk romance of Richard Linklater's Before Trilogy, which is some of my favourite films of all time. So, you know, you know, big thumbs up for pulling from that already. And it's injected it with such infectiously positive and riotously entertaining energy that I was grabbed by the lapels from the opening frame and, and hurtled through to the very finish. I was rocked out of my seat, as was the entire audience. Everyone at the end got up and said to their friends or partners, that was great. Everyone is agree- was in agreement as to how you know, much fun it was watching it. The two central performances are fabulous. David Johnson as Dom brings a certain humorous degree of nervously jerky sort of sad boy energy but also weaves in a in a direct compassion and subtly smirking wit that's really irresistible vivian apara as yaz is ap- delivers an absolutely star making performance her high gout the caliber comedic timing never falters and her bullish and charmingly braggadocious energy is commanding and rousing and her, her wise outlook and empathy also makes her personality compelling beyond her just being a fiery free spirit. Their chemistry is fantastic. They soften each other's harder edges and also tease the brightness out of each other at various points in the runtime. There's real, you know, speaking about, you know, the lack of emotional peaks and valleys in The Five Devils, you know, this is the polar opposite of that. And they're absolutely dynamite together. The script and dialogue are razor sharp. It's hysterically funny. It's one of the funniest films I've seen in a very long time. The, myself and the audience w- laughed frequently and hard the entire way through. There's a superb balance of like prickly observational humour on human behaviour, these slightly absurdist situational comedy kind of almost slapstick kind of sequences, and sort of hijinks in various people's houses. And these perfectly honed, cutting verbal jabs. Some of the off-handed comments that capped off certain conversations were so out of left field funny. I was like laughing deep into the next scene. I almost had to curtail it because I thought, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna miss what they're saying in this next scene if I don't stop giggling. And the situational humour, it's not so overplayed or or outlandish that it loses credibility, but it's heightened enough to land the intended laughs. There's also there's a brilliantly knowing sort of you know, wink at the audience with regards to the inevitable, you know, Richard Curtis comparisons. Comparisons they go to this, you know, chili stand and rap stand called Love Guac Chili. Oh no! <laughs> Which I thought was so great. And there's a, I won't spoil it, but there's a cameo by you know, a by British acting royalty in that scene that's so wonderfully placed. Um, but you know, aside from this, from the joys of the script, there's this propulsive visual buoyancy and inventiveness in Rye Lane with its camera work that, that reminded me a lot of Train Spotting, another personal favourite movie of mine. So you know, oh weird, they're, they're hitting person, up. but I'm not, I'm not mad about it. But that seems yeah. a strange way to go. <laughs> just, the, just, just the level, the the vibrant colours and the heavy, the heavy punchy flashes of colour and and pans that whip in and out of like seamless location transitions and dip in and out of reality to explain and visualize past events it it felt very danny boyle for me and and dom and yaz will frequently jump into past events they are describing you know physically inhabit them there's one hilarious sequence that it conceptualizes the retelling of yaz's breakup 
there's a stage production that's being viewed by a hundred copies of Dom in the audience, and they're kind of shouting and actively reacting to the story she's telling. And the the attention to visual innovation, you know, added boatloads of personality to the film and kept it consistently involving. They do have this thing about very frequently using anamorphic lenses, which for anyone who doesn't know, it's a lens which kind of, it's not quite a fisheye, but it's a lens that rounds off and slightly curves and distorts the edges of the frame. When they're sort of walking alongside buildings, they have a thing about very frequently using anamorphic lenses. I reckon they could have called that just a little bit, but, you know, I've always said I would, I would rather film a film, I would rather a film do too much than too little. And, you know, that's such a minor gripe to you talk about the use of lens <laughs> in, a, <laughs> in a film's visual style. I also have to give the highest praise to the locations team and art department. Every every street, shopping centre, art gallery, building, pub, and apartment is eye-popping in its set design and the colours and how they've either dressed the sets or the buildings they've just chosen to shoot in front of. The sprightly colours, they, they just erupt forth from the screen. And they're made all the more sumptuous by, you know, the wonderfully stylish framing and clean, you know, dancing, graceful, steady cam moves that are often used throughout as the as the characters are walking through the city. And these settings add, again, endless amounts of character, you know, enhancing both visual appeal, but also guiding Rye Lane tonally through its more comedic and dramatic moments. The, the, the design and the verve it gives to the film is just to die for. It, it also it runs an airtight 77 minutes if you take out the five or so minutes for the credits um, with no room for filler or events that aren't always progressing the plot or the character development, which is constantly and beautifully evolving on the fly within the character's conversations. It's, it's wonderful to see that happen just so perfectly in the moment, have that, you know, that freewheeling quality to the development. I guess... You know, one story gripe people could maybe credibly level at Rye Lane is that it's not especially new or deep, but while that whilst that is true to a certain extent, I actually thought that in the cynical and pessimistic state of the current world, its points on insecurity in young people, empathy, and having both the courage and dignity to chase and seize opportunity, both, you know, romantic or career focused. I found really empowering and refreshing and it felt as though it was really hitting at just the right social time considering what's going on currently. I could also make a, another very minor criticism of a point about you know the characters and their conversation that feels ever so slightly artificial. I guess a slight injection of artificial conflict but when you actually look at the film in a more macro sense and the insecurities of the characters and the sort of very bristly personalities. It, it actually does it does make sense when you view it in that sense. And again, you know, it's about as minor a gripe as my point about the lenses. Um, and it just it absolutely sticks the landing at the very end. I I could go on for so much longer about everything this film does so right, but and I I, I don't think it's hyperbole to say that, with exception of maybe about time. Or the big sick. This smokes pretty much any rom com for breakfast that I've seen since 2010. Like I, I mean, I know, and I know the the bar isn't very high, but you know, as a coming of age film, as a, as a rom com, as a British rom com, this is just, you know, of the highest quality and firing on all cylinders. And I absolutely loved it from start to finish. I would give this an A plus. I'd give this some high highest rating. I would urge anyone while this is still in cinemas to go see it. You'll have the best time. So that's all we have time for this week. So Billy, what is coming up next week apart from Dungeons and Dragons, which we're definitely doing, and I'm not going to let yes. you say no. <laughs> I know you're very excited for Dungeons and Dragons. I also feel an obligation to our uni friendship group to to do it for them. To, yes. to give my thoughts on it we'll also be doing the the ben affleck and matt damon reunion that is air you know the on the but you know biopic on the on the formation of the the nike air and how the discovery of michael jordan every as well time, in the basketball every time i hear the title of that film my mind instantly goes air bud the film about the dog who can play basketball <laughs> but <laughs> Clearly not related. I mean, oh. there's basketball, but I'm I'm still like, if there's not a dog in the movie, it will have greatly disappointed me. 
Can you imagine if you said that to the filmmakers and they were just like, oh, yes, remind them of... Our movie reminds you of a basketball playing dog. Yes, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> the, the most glowing endorsement. Yes, so we're doing Air, we're doing Dungeons and Dragons. We'll be doing another audience uh, pick next week, another audience recommendation, which I'm very much looking forward to making a, a regular segment. And we'll also be doing two very kind of sinister and, you know, again, again atmospheric. Uh, well, I, I, one of them is a British drama, another is a, I think, a Spanish drama. Uh, one is The Beasts and one is God's Creatures. I'm looking forward to those sort of darkly grimy human tales. Nice. So if your if your suggestions to us didn't get picked this week, do not fear. We're going to be putting out more calls for recommendations. Please keep them coming. It's been lovely to listen to what some of you guys want us to review. We're keeping them all on a big sheet. So if your pick wasn't chosen this time, do not fear. It may be in a future episode. We'll be back. We'll be back next week. Do make sure to follow us on Instagram, Apple Podcasts, and Spotify. And we thank you very much for listening. We'll see you next week. Bye. Bye.